So thank you for the intro. I am Kevin Galligan. I run a company called Touch Lab. Um, we do run DroidCon NYC, um, the big Android developers meetup in New York, which is to say uh, we do a lot of community stuff. We talk to a lot of devs. We've been an Android shop since about 2011, uh, up till about 2016, exclusively Android. Um, and we work on stuff from small startups all the way up to big companies you'd recognize uh, that we don't really talk about publicly. Um, yada, yada, that's, that's kind of what I do. Except I'm technically president, but I, I've really sort of walked away from day to day, and I become sort of the, the guy in the back room working on weird stuff and research. Um, and coming to Berlin to give talks and, and, and rather than sitting in the office and dealing with clients. And uh, kind of doing strategy uh, about this stuff with a few clients as well. So, um, Android Enterprise. And <laughs> I heard this track was happening and I'm like, well, I know, I know the folks doing it and um, we're trying to talk to enterprise people more rather than startups. So it kind of fits. Um, but it's like, what's, what's Android Enterprise? So like when you hear about it, you kind of think of EDM or MDM and security devices at work. Uh, we're more focused on development and the process of development. Um, so it's definitely an Android-leaning perspective, but this is going to be a little more outside of just Android and more mobile. So um, mobile-oriented architecture. I wrote a blog post about this, which I summarized for the conference submission. Um, the post was a little more looking forward and kind of not a lot of detail. Maybe we'll be in a few years. The talk had to be a little more, I think, uh, concrete. So it's kind of about that. Uh, but then we kind of get a little more like, what can you do now? Um, that's sort of about the talk. Um, it's really more like not trying to pick what's going to be popular in a few years, but trying to pick things that are less risky and reduce like bad choices for a few years. That's kind of what we were focused on. Um, and uh, the marketing people at Touch Lab really hate when I talk about the talk at the talk. Um, I'm what you'd call not a very formal speaker, but they're not here, so <laughs> I'm gonna tell you, I was having trouble kind of sorting this talk out, and then I realized it's because I'm trying to make like three talks and five blog posts into like one talk that's just technical enough to like get the concept across. So it's gonna be wandering a bit, but just assume we'll get to some reasonable point by the end. So uh, the simple concepts of MOA um, are as follows. Everything's mobile, right? And a lot of this is going to be stuff that we're getting when we're talking to large um, orgs and that are trying to do, like, move into the next phase of whatever they're doing, right? So one of the things we hear a lot is, you know, when 5G comes along, does offline matter? You know, when this happens, does that matter? And my response is, like, that was the same conversation we had with 4G. And, like, regardless of what happens in the future, everything you're going to do is going to be mobile. And you have to just think of it that way. Even if you're not really doing mobile, you should be architecting it as if, unless it's, you know, clearly there are examples that's not true. Um, but don't think that technology is going to solve your mobile problem. And mobile should lead. And by that, I really mean most cross-platform solutions up until now were essentially trying to take web stuff and make it into mobile stuff. Um, PhoneGap, Ionic, Titanium, Native Script, React Native, Flutter fans, earmuffs, but Flutter kind of too. Um, that's a longer discussion, I know. And we're at a Google conference, kind of, so uh, I won't go there too much. But the tech isn't so important to me because you can kind of do whatever you want to do with the tech. It's very often the thinking that goes into it, like a large org with web devs. Now I have a web solution for the mobile, and I'm going to bring my web ideas to it. And that, like, it's kind of like that phase is over. We should be the mobile community um, pushing our like, architectural ideas onto the web, because we've had like a decade to sort of think about these things. So if you're here, uh, and that was an interesting thing, I'm like, who's going to be here? Who's a developer? Okay. Um, it's technical-ish. <laughs> it's kind of more for people that are like, what should we do with our development teams? But I don't know, it's a mess. Anyway, uh, but we have good points. Anyway, so the future, if you're here, you're probably trying to figure out like, what are we going to do with our team for like the next five years or a decade, right? And it seems like in 2018, things are more um, uncertain than ever. So like in 2015, this wasn't true everywhere, but it felt like a lot of companies were either going to make two native apps and separate code bases of the web, or they were going to pick some cross-platform thing and just accept that they weren't happy entirely with the UX. And that was like 
the trade-off and everything was cool, right? And then in 2018, like things are kind of changing, right? All this stuff's happening. Um, and the native dev world, like this is the first year, especially running Android conferences. And I've been doing DroidCon for five years. Um, it's the first year that cross-platform isn't taboo in, in a, a meaningful way, right? So in the orgs we talk to, the conversation is increasingly shifting from like, should we, to which one? And the situation like really has changed, right? So for mobile, uh, we have a pretty stable two-platform situation now for the last two years. Um, years of effort to bring those two things together with the web. And uh, I like the point, like there's millions of apps in the App Store, which means like billions of hours of work. So there's a lot of pressure to like not do it the way we've been doing it. So um, it seems like everything's kind of uncertain in 2018, but I, I was doing a little like, let's go down memory lane. And things are kind of always uncertain in the tech world for the last few decades meaning of always. Uh, so we're going to go back to 2008 and get some perspective. So this is a browser chart. Uh, IE was almost everything. Uh, there's Firefox, like uh, the orange thing that was in double digits, which was really cool. And Chrome actually didn't exist as of today 10 years ago, at least not publicly. So that should mean something. Uh, Flash was like super cool. Uh, almost half the web was flashed. Incidentally. Um, if somebody really has a lot of time, it would be really cool to get a post-mortem on what happened with Flash at Adobe, like an insider's perspective. Because there was a period of time where if Flash didn't like ruin itself, I think, it would have been most of the interactive web and possibly mobile in some, in some corners at least, and it just all fell apart. Anyway, throwing it out there, that'd be cool if someone did it. I won't. Um, so the App Store launched a couple weeks from now, 10 years ago, on the iPhone, and it had 552 apps. And there are probably orgs that are building apps that have more than that themselves at this point. And just as some outside perspective, 3D TVs were just starting to be talked about as the cool next thing. And that went really well for everybody. So 10 years is a long time, essentially. Um, I can't really see the future, but because uh, predicting the future is difficult. But I talked to a lot of Developers, you know, DroidCon NYC, spent a lot of time, you know, talking to them about Flutter or a PWAs or some other new framework or some other new thing, and it kind of changes every year. People get excited, then they try stuff and they get unexcited. Um, some folks here, well, actually, you're almost all devs, so it kind of changes my talk. <laughs> but uh, if we imagine some folks were here for enterprise stuff, um, there's a little observation about sort of these two groups when you talk about technology. So. Uh, I'm, I'm super focused on like safe bets and discussions with the dev about new tech and discussions with management about new tech differ most like on one thing, which is basically risk. And uh, there's lots of reasons, but that's the most basic. So I, I kind of had this thought really, like the cost for an individual developer to really advocate for a new tech, to go do a talk, write a blog post, wear the t-shirt, like whatever, uh, if the industry shifts, the cost is really low. But if you're like a manager, especially if you kind of like don't understand the tech very deeply and you advocate to retrain a thousand devs for something and then the industry decides that that's no longer a thing, uh, that's a different cost. So there was a thing, and, and I don't know if, depends how long you've been doing this, we used to say nobody gets fired for buying Oracle. Um, and the, the argument was like, if you got the money and you buy Oracle, you're cool. If you got the money and you tell them to do something else that other people don't feel comfortable with, that's your problem once, if it goes bad. Or if anything else goes bad, they're going to blame it on that. So I'm not looking for the coolest tech so much as finding the least risky. And that's sort of the, the spin on this. So in the spirit of not taking risks, I'm going to talk about just mobile for code sharing first because that's a lot easier. Uh, partly deep experience on our part. But mostly because the web has a number of built-in uh, restrictions that aren't related just to language, right? And uh, that'll make common architecture somewhat more difficult to talk about. So I like to put this slide up. Um, if you're aware of what this is, this is Java probably a, a couple, I don't know, I mean a couple decades ago. But it was when they were talking about they're going to have write once, run anywhere. We're going to have a common thing. All the UIs are going to be the same yada, yada, and I put it up and people are kind of like, yeah, haha, ha, what a huge failure. Um, but it's the UI for Java as a shared UI was kind of a big failure. Shared logic with Java 
um, and the ability to sh like have ubiquitous sharing of your code and, and deploy at different places, um, that's kind of a success you can't really put a number on. So uh, that's kind of why I like to put that slide up is like you got to rethink you know what really failed and what didn't. So in the mobile space. Um, we tend to focus on Android and iOS being super different. And I kind of use this slide as like the analogy there. Um, yeah, Coke and Pepsi are super different, yet they're both like, like sugar water and an aluminum can, right? So under the hood, iOS and Android are uh, super, super, super very similar. Like they're both, you know, threads and they're both Unixy and they both have SQLite and they can do networking and all this kind of stuff. So um, our approach was really to take, we took this thing called, it's called Doppel, uh, it takes JWJC and we put some, a bunch of Android architecture around it from AOSP, and then um, took a bunch of popular libraries over here, and we were, built, we were able to like essentially generate Objective-C from our shared code and shared the bulk of our architecture from Android to iOS. And this is something that Google built, the underlying technology. Um, they use it in a ton of stuff. If you have an iPhone, you almost certainly have apps on it that is running this. Uh, not sexy. <laughs> I'll tell you that right now. Um, and uh, actually, this morning, uh, Jake called me out uh, because I'm like the only person that anyone knows that ever talks about J2OBJC. So what? There you go. All right, well, we can talk after, you know, come, come, let's, let's chat at the, at the drinks. Um, so we're actually, we're using, we're putting in stuff. I, I, we're putting in a lot of stuff. I can't really talk about most of it. Um, well, a lot, a few projects. It is sometimes a hard sell. But uh, like we just did this, right, um, thing called Pie Top. So Pizza Hut 1 did an ad campaign. And in the sneaker, there's a button you press that opens an app, and then you can order a pizza. And that was Pie Top's 1 uh, last year and Pie Top's 2 this year. And we both had to have fully functional ordering apps on a cross-platform, uh, and we had about a month to do it. So, uh, and the order flow, like every other backend service, is like fairly complex and brittle and no docs, all that stuff. Um, we kept the UIs real dumb and localized the weird logic all in one code base, and it worked really well. Uh, I put, I'll get back to that later with some interesting stories. So, why this kind of solution, right? And it's one thing is shared natively, right? The, the code that comes out is Objective-C. There's no weird bridging layer. Uh, it's got a very smooth interop. And it's actually, the Android side is 100% Android, so there's no like third thing. And that, I've always said, is like really critical to why I think that's a really great option. You can share optionally. So if you want to, on the next sprint, just take a few like small classes or some functionality, it's very easy to like share a little bit. You don't need to make a big decision. Big decisions are bad. So, um, that's something to remember. Good language. Uh, Java is still good, even though we all hate it now, uh, especially compared to like C++. Not that C++ is bad. And actually, in my recent experience using C line, it's quite helpful. And there's actually a talk going on right now I'd love to go to about using C++, but I wouldn't recommend it for most people. And certainly the community around mobile C++ isn't exactly huge. Uh, and great tools, right? Android Studio. You know, that you kind of can't get better than that, at least in our world. So, um, which brings me up to this, which is, oh, by the way, Xamarin Studio. We were trying Xamarin a lot. If you ever use Xamarin Studio, that will slow your project right the hell down, at least in 2015, 2016. I have no idea what Microsoft's done to it since then. So, uh, Airbnb put out this post about they're, they're getting rid of React Native, and uh, that was kind of a bombshell for that community. The, and this is like a week ago, maybe a little more. The reasons, um, you know, there were a number of them, but it was largely kind of around, you know, now you have this third environment and you're maintaining bridging code and it's just like this extra effort to do what you need to do. And again, this is like, to me, totally made sense. This is like, you need smooth interrupt, you need a native environment, you don't want to maintain a third thing. Um, and that's why I was like, I don't know why people are so excited about React Native. Not to dig on React Native, I'm sure it's great. but. Uh, I've always said that. And they also pointed out one of the things that is difficult is the amount of code you're going to share between mobile and the web, which I'll get to later, can be relatively minimal. So I bring this up just to say, like, what sounds really good on paper and what sounds really good when you do a tutorial and do it for like a week doesn't necessarily pan out in a large scale app. And that's something that is very difficult to see up front. And you have to look for good examples and talk to people. Um, but the week before that, uh, I think maybe they had some kind of a heads up that Airbnb was going to 
you know, politely throw them under the bus. Uh, Facebook put out their state of React Native, because one of the big questions was like, why do they make it? How much do they use it? Because for a long time, they didn't use it in anything. But um, they're refactoring the bridge. Um, I don't know if that's really going to get over the issue on Android and the JNI, but they're doing that. They're trying to make it a much more usable thing. So we'll see. A lot of people love it. Maybe it'll work out. But the thing to bear in mind is that even on React Native, like you're still doing two native experiences. Um, you know, uh, so uh, you're not really doing a shared UI. So for me, like doing a shared code and architecture and not having a third environment is like the simpler plan. Because it doesn't necessarily work out that you're just going to hire JavaScript devs to build mobile. And that's kind of the, the broken promise or whatever. I didn't say broken promise. Not quite fulfilled promise of React Native. So anyway, we released this a year ago. And it totally works. We use it. And this is what the developer community's general response was. Um, multiple reasons. Number one, uh, it's not a good time to release a Java and Objective-C thing for anybody in the mobile community. Uh, it's not very forward thinking. Like, it solves this problem for right now. It's not going to do much else. And we don't really have a DevRel team or a budget. And again, not to dig on, I won't even say Flutter. I wonder how much of the excitement is really due because Google's really investing in the DevRel team. And I bring that up only because, like, Let's think in the past year how much you've heard of Realm. And usually people are like, oh, yeah, I haven't heard anything about Realm in the last year. And they just coincidentally had to cut a lot of their DevRel. And I'm sorry if anybody here works with Realm, I take it all back. But really, it's, a, you know, it's kind of coincidental. So I don't know, was that, were they related? What's going on? So sometimes it's hard to figure out where the excitement is coming from the developer community. Anyway, no one cared about our thing. Um, Doppel technical preview, that's the Medium post, 158 reads over the past year. And we released something on Friday that currently has, for Kotlin native, that has 2,200 2, reads. So if that gives you sort of uh, an indication of developer excitement about stuff and how much that matters. We, um, it's interesting. So we're going and talking to a lot of large orgs about this process, right? And so a very large sports uh, organization in the US um, brought us in, and they had decided we're going to pick something because they're tired of making all these apps. And they hired somebody that was going to navigate them through that, and they brought us in to talk to that somebody who, that somebody had already decided React Native because they did some small project earlier and they thought it was going to be great. So we talked to the Android people and said, hey, this is happening. What do you think about our cross platform thing? And they said, nah, we do Kotlin, we don't do Java. And we talked to the iOS people and they said, nah, Swift, this is garbage. And my response was like, you know, you're not bringing us here. They're making a decision, and mobile needs a better answer than just, we're going to keep doing the same thing, which is really like what I've been kind of obsessed with for the last you know, year and change. So on Friday, um, we released this thing, which is essentially SQLite on Kotlin native and multi-platform that you can essentially taking AOSP and like kind of trimming it down, but it works, and then you can do SQL Delight on top of it. So that's like out. It still needs some polish, but that's going to be ready in the next few weeks, and that everyone seemed to like that. Doppel's still active. We're using it, but we're probably not going to expend it. I'm kind of handing it off to someone else on the team. That's going to be their thing. But uh, yeah, this is more forward thinking, cleaner imitation, and this is really what we're exciting about. And excited, exciting, excited. Um, and also, this, uh, this went out Friday. So Again, this is also part of why this talk is a lot looser than I had planned. So just bear with me. Uh, that was pretty distracting. So um, by the end of the summer, I think um, several core architectural libraries necessary for mobile development on Kotlin multi-platform are going to be ready to go. And this slide is actually about a month old, so several of these things are already ready. Um, post Kotlin Conf, uh, building multi-platform will be like reasonably productive, and I think early next year. It's going to be mainstream. And I don't mean like everyone's going to be using it, but you could, and it's not like a risky thing, right? And I'm also speaking at Kotlin Comp about this whole topic, so I'm super excited about that. And I'm just letting everyone know. So um, the recap, shared logic and architecture on mobile is cool. Um, Traits of a good solution, smooth interop, and you know, not a third thing. Good language tools, community, that you can do it optionally. And there are multiple options. It's not just you know, these two things I brought up. But we have our preferences for the reasons listed. And Rust is cool, but I don't have time for that. So um, the web. What about the web, right? 
And that's kind of what the point of MOA, at least the post originally, was about. So I think the first thing to bring up is like disambiguating when we say web and when we say hybrid. And they're kind of a different thing. Um, using HTML to render your app, if it's inside of a container, aka PhoneGap or Cordova or whatever, um, it's similar, but you can really do whatever you want. Like if you want to use SQL, you can use SQL. On web, um, there are restrictions you know, imposed by standards bodies, by the platform implementers. Like there's no SQL because somebody at Firefox didn't like SQL and they essentially vetoed it and look it up, interesting story. Um, I'll kind of talk about that later. iOS supports PWAs, like I support being an adult, you know, which is like kinda. Um, and that'll probably change as time goes on. I'm actually shocked that they support them at all. Um, and, but you know, it's an interesting story. One of the DroidCon keynotes from our first year, we had a dual keynote. Uh, I ran into him recently and he said, yeah, we're using React Web, not native, React Web on the mobile app. He decided to get rid of their Android app. So it works great. So like times, they are changing. I think in this native community, we kind of don't, we haven't really been keeping an eye on that. And so uh, we'll see. But again, I can't predict the future. I don't know. Um, I did a post probably in 2012. I know you can't read that. I'm just putting it up there for people to get slides later. Uh, essentially, it was saying, it was arguing that if Google and Apple really wanted HTML5 and the web to be a platform, it would be because these other companies did it with like no budget. Um, that was true then. It definitely has flipped completely for Google. Like Google is absolutely, well, the Chrome team, I won't say Google. Uh, the Chrome team, I think, is absolutely committed to making apps, uh, web, like an app-like experiences in a very fluid thing, aka, you know, very related to the keynote this morning. And I totally agree with, well, most of what he was saying. Um, and Apple is sort of like reluctantly, but they're kind of going along with that, I think, just because, hey, you got you to do what you got to do, right? Um, let's see. Uh, blah, 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 blah. But who knows? I don't know how far that's going to go. I don't know if the, the pendulum's going to swing back. I thought we were going to be mostly web in like 2013, if you asked me, in 2011. And here we are. So uh, Kotlin multi-platform. Again, um, it's not necessarily easy to architect for mobile and the web due to those restrictions, right? Because the web, you can kind of do what you want. Uh, I mean, mobile, you can do what you want, and the web is like kind of this different thing. But I think, you know, if the community is building the good tool sets and the libraries that support it and the training for the people on the team to know how to execute it, it'll definitely be like a feasible thing. Um, the purpose is not like, is to not have widely separate code bases and teams, uh, but it's also to like not have to make a big decision about what's going to happen over the next whatever X numbers of years, right? Um, and then require big sweeping decisions and refactors and all this kind of stuff. Like a lot of people pick React Native because it sounds like the safe choice. You know, you'll, you'll always need web and JavaScript, so we have a single team. But then, um, let's see, they're like, you know, that didn't work out in some cases, right? So there are other ways to do it, other languages, but Kotlin is the focus that we're taking for the reasons that I brought up. And you can render JavaScript with Kotlin, but I also very much agree with the keynote on WebAssembly, which is super, super exciting. <sighs> I think it's going to be a little while, like at least a couple of years. There's stuff that needs to happen. And the perfect, you know, full disclosure, I talked to the Kotlin Native team, and they were like, even though they are rendering Kotlin Native to WebAssembly, they're a little concerned about how much that's going to be adopted. But I'm hopeful. So, uh, yeah, Jake went over that earlier. But, um, well, if you missed it, it's like all current browsers support like MVP level, there's going to be threads and bindings and stuff coming sometime over the next couple of years. I think 2020, this will be like really happening. Uh, the big question I wanted to see emerge is like, what happens to JavaScript if you don't need it? And uh, that'll be really interesting to see when that goes on. And other people are making sort of bold predictions, like whoever this guy is. I spent a lot of time digging on the web. Um, Go, Swift, Rust will be one third of the front end code. I fixed his slide. So I think that's more true. So um, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, anyway, I think he's a little bullish, but it's definitely coming, and I think it'll be really cool. Um, even if WebAssembly comes around, it's not like JavaScript goes away, but if you have large JavaScript code bases, they're going to start to feel pretty antiquated if you have all these little languages that people are really into. And uh, suddenly the cool kids will be doing something else. Um, 
Kotlin specifically, especially in large orgs that have investments in Java, and there are quite a few of those orgs. So we'll see how that goes. Um, I had this thought actually today, and I was kind of tiptoeing around this before, but like, you know, SQL did get killed because like one or two people decided to veto it for the web. Um, but, you know, we're like a big community. How do these web standards get made? Can we start a thing that starts to try to get things that we need in mobile architecture back into web browsers? I think we can. I don't know how we do that, but like, I want SQL back in the browsers, like officially. So, uh, I don't know where we're going to start, but like, I guess keep an eye out for that. Like, there's got to be a way to go back to them and be like, hey, uh, you know, <laughs> we're part of this community too. We have a different idea. Like it shouldn't just be a couple of people deciding what we should use, I guess, not to get all on my soapbox. We'll see how it goes, but that's the thought. The idea was, you know, bending the matrix, like change actual browsers and the situation. That's why the slide. Anyway, uh, other thoughts. So, great. You can share a bunch of code. Um, what does that do, right? So. I'm just kind of throwing out some of our disconnected thoughts about this. Um, this really is where it gets into multiple long talks about different scenarios, and we're just going to kind of run through it. So um, there's this implied belief that two native apps takes twice the amount of work. And I get that a lot, especially talking to agency marketing people. So that's when they're like, yeah, they, they try to market React Native, and they're like, hey, you know, we'll just do this one thing. But um, unless you are iterating at the same time with two teams that don't talk to each other, um, that's really not how it goes. Like I was an Android, running an Android shop for you know, six, seven years exclusively, and all of our work for the first few years was like, hey, here's our iPhone app, can you make an Android app? And then you have something that's done, that's a complete model with code, and they've already sorted out their architecture and the back end. So the amount of work we have to do versus what they have to do is dramatically different. Um, I had this other thought as like a good example. Um, a lot of the, oh, so no, I'll get to that later. Sorry, another slide. I know it's coming. Anyway, uh, so most product work is waste, and it's, it's useful waste, um, but still it gets thrown out, right? So if you're iterating on the API from the back end, if you've got architectural odysseys going on in your front end code, um, service structure, and then you got you know user stuff, screen layouts, features, testing uh, iterations, all that kind of stuff, right? Um, your environment tax is kind of on everything. So if you pick like a really bad, uh, well, bad, not ideal development situation, um, you wind up spending a lot more just to get the same amount of functionality. So the kind of analogy I'm making is um, Instagram sort of famously didn't release on Android for a long time. And the argument was like they wanted to flush out their product on iOS. Um, ironically, Facebook now is trying to push some React Native into Instagram. But I think if React Native existed when Instagram started and they had used it to build because they were financially constrained or whatever, um, Instagram would have failed. Like they wouldn't have been able to move fast enough to get where they needed to go. Um, Obviously, that's highly speculative and sounds like a bunch of bullshit, but that's what I think, like, if you think about it that way. So um, the product differentiation is everything, and this, I quote our marketing guy, Greg, um, you know, what differentiates product? Is it design? Like, kind of, but there's a lot of flashy, bad apps out there. And tech, like, most apps really don't push the boundaries of the tech that they're dealing with. Um, it's how well you align what you're building with what people want and get there before others do in some cases or before you just run out of money in the cases of most startups. So um, that's like if those things sound reasonable to you, uh, to, you know, second platform with less work and fast iteration is crucial, then um, two fully separate native apps can often be less work than one cross-platform app, like full stop. Um, and that's kind of a hard sell to people, like intellectually, but I think as native developers, we kind of intuitively understand that. Um, so anyway, so uh, yeah, blah, 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 blah. And anyway, so um, yeah, our preferred method of doing this, especially in the case of you know, Topple and soon like Kotlin multi-platform, you're kind of using the best tools. You're not introducing a lot of your you know, environment tax. Um, you're using the best libraries in like one ecosystem. Um, yeah, 
So keeping the UI is really dumb, yada, yada. Uh, <laughs> I kind of lost my own train of thought there. So anyway, um, yeah, going back to PyTops briefly. Um, and I was going to say developer friends and earmuffs, but you're all developers, so uh, never mind. Uh, this time around, we built the, kept the UIs real dumb, uh, again, testable and all that kind of stuff. And we did the Android in-house, and we just sent like the iOS screens offshore, which is uh, not something that we would normally do. But the second platform doesn't need a lot of communication. You, know, you don't need to like do any product design. You're just kind of sending designs and screens, and the architecture is already done. So it was really like, you know, I don't know. It's probably not going to make a lot of developers happy, but that's what's happening out there. And it was totally doable with this kind of um, situation. So um, yeah, we actually had a Flutter situation. And I can't explain why, but we were parallel building this in Flutter. But it was optional. Like If we didn't get there, it didn't matter. And we got to the login screen. And the client had this very weird morphing logo. Like They needed this thing because it was an ad campaign. And we couldn't just get around it. So. Uh, we used Lottie for Android and iOS, and um, Lottie on Flutter looks like this. It's like this abandoned project, and they haven't made a commit in like 10 months. So that's not to dig on them so much to say um, the first screen in the app we were trying to build was going to require either manual crazy coding or dumping out to Android and iOS just to implement like a simple thing, which is not fair in some ways. Like, of course, a year or two from now, this won't be the same situation. But the reality is if you're making decisions about what you're going to do now, these are things you have to consider. So if we had tried to build that PyTops app in Flutter and committed to doing it, we definitely would have spent more time just getting that app done versus doing it native, which is not sexy, but less risky, I guess, if you're a Flutter fan. It's not sexy. Otherwise, people love native. Anyway, uh, yada, yada. So. Um, Another idea that we were bringing up, and this is definitely for like larger orgs. Um, we, some of the orgs we're talking to are trying to figure out, like, OK, we want to consolidate apps. We have all these back-end developers. What are we going to do to retrain them? You know? And they're like sending them to classes on Angular and trying to turn them into UX gurus. And, and, and it's kind of like, um, I think that's sort of a, not the way to go. Uh, so we were talking to them like, um, I'm going to skip this whole story because it's not pointless. But uh, <laughs> you like essentially in an architecture like this. This is I, I swiped this from a microservice talk I did. Um, you got all this stuff set up. You know the back end is all nice and whatever. And then every client has to write its own you know client code to consume the back end service, which is like obviously not an ideal situation. And in a situation like this, which is like ideally where you want to go in a shared code thing, all that stuff is like shared architecture. And the idea is actually like retraining or repurposing the people that are back end people to actually to get really good at building um, the remote client and then treating the whole thing as a unified whole rather than every client being like this thing that's written by this other team. Because in reality, it, it really is. And, and also, there's, there's other things that fall out of this, right? So again, going back to 5G. When we're talking to people, they're talking about, hey, we're going to push a lot of logic to the server. And if the purpose of that is to like, cut down on your coding overhead, um, a situation like this really just makes that not an issue. And again, like 5G will help, but it's still like doing network. It's still delay. It's still not ideal. So you shouldn't push it to the server just for the purposes of cutting down on your, on your coding work. So that's one of the things we talk to these enterprise folks about. But the oversimplification, of course, in that situation is that most things really look like this. Like your mobile apps are doing the same thing, but your web and mobile are kind of doing sort of different things. But even in there, it's still like a cleaner situation to build this sort of thing. And going along this morning with the web like blurring into mobile, um, sorry, mobile blurring into the web, in this kind of environment, if you're able to leverage shared code with that in, uh, between all these platforms, the process and the, the decision making around trying to put some functionality into the web or even code delivering it becomes a lot less problematic. And again, it goes back to small decisions, small refactors, and that kind of stuff, which is, again, why we're super arguing for this kind of stuff. So um, kind of TLDR, uh, sharing logic and architecture is good. Um, shared UI and or foreign platforms is kind of tricky. Um, Small choices, safe bets can be sexy too. 
and everything is mobile and your remote client is part of your service. And I put a joke in here that I question now, but I'll throw it out there anyway. Uh, anybody says they you know the future and still has to work for a living is wrong about knowing the future. So um, that's it. That is my overview. Uh, we're, of course, actively looking for orgs who want to get started on doing this because um, we found stuff with the Java thing, but the Kotlin stuff is still taking some time. And to be clear, that makes sense. It's going to be sort of end of the year before that's really, really baked. But you can definitely deploy stuff now. Uh, we're definitely hiring, although I'm in Europe right now, and I don't work here. So I don't know how many people are going to apply. Um, but I'll just throw that out there anyway. And uh, I guess that's it. Are there any questions? Thanks, Kevin. Yeah. Thank you.